Hey all, hope all is well. This is another video in the Road to Grandmaster series. And in this one, I'm going to go over my fifth and final round game from the Eastern Open. Now, if you followed the round four video, you know that I won a nice game against a young FM, Liam Putnam. And this basically put me on a three and a half out of four score, which was quite remarkable considering you know, I hadn't really played many great games, if any, and so to really be on three and a half out of four going to the last round was really great. Now, my opponent in this one was someone I actually know fairly well. Um, he's an international master from New York by the name of Justin Sarkar, and he's actually uh, not your average inter you're not your average international master because he actually has four grand master norms. So he actually just needs the rating to get to the title, and um, he's still working on chess. So I think he has a pretty good shot. Um, and, uh, yeah, just a really, really tough opponent. I, I can recall coming up at the Marshall Chess Club when I was a teenager and seeing him playing at a pretty high level. So a uh, tough test uh, in this one, especially with the black pieces, to try and offset what he was going to try and do and maybe even play for a win. So without further ado, let's get into it. So Justin opened with d4, and I played d5. This has been typ standard, typical fare for me. And after c4, e6, we have you know this queen's gamut decline setup. And I knew from previous games that typically Justin is more of a knight c3 type of guy. Um, typically when you are playing against d4 players in the queen's gamut decline, you have to ask yourself, so are they knight f3 uh, and g3 type of people? Or do they like to go for the Catalan? Or do they like to go knight c3 and to play c takes d5 and those types of setups? I knew because Justin is also a, a Nimzo Indian uh, player with white, like he welcomes that setup, I knew that he was a knight c3 type of person. So I expected knight c3. And lo and behold, that came on the board. After knight c3, I went knight f6. I'm pretty much inviting c takes d5, uh, opting for some queen's gambit exchange variation type setups. Obviously, if you've seen my game against Moisenko, you know that these, these this setup I know fairly well. But instead here, he actually was the first to surprise because he played the move bishop g5. And this is a move... I didn't really expect from him. I didn't really think it was a part of his repertoire. Um, and uh, I really did expect the exchange variation. But by playing bishop g5 now and keeping the tension in the center longer, we actually shift to a whole nother sort of branch of the queen's gamut declined, which is, I believe, the Tartikauer variation of the dec decline. That's what I think it's called. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. But basically, in this structure... Uh, this tension on c4, d5 just lasts a bit longer, and white tries to, you know, basically take and resolve the tension in the structure at a later date. So anyways, after bishop g5, I went bishop e7. And by the way, this is a position that, this position isn't totally foreign to me because I did play a game uh, against Mark Paragua that is on this channel that I went over uh, maybe about a week or two ago in one of my previous tournaments, uh, which was a nice win. So it's not totally foreign to me, but just a little bit of a surprise. So after bishop b7, white went e3. I castled. And then after knight f3, I played the move h6. And h6 is a really interesting move. Um, very, very useful to give your king a uh, luft and escape square. But it's also to kind of challenge this bishop and ask it to make a decision. Because white could elect to take uh, the knight and you know forfeit the bishop pair but get some more pressure on the d5 pawn because the knight was an important defender of that pawn. And some people do enjoy to take on f6 and then take on d5 and argue that the pawn structure that black has uh, wouldn't be so great because there is sometimes some minority attack ideas with b4, b5, and sometimes d5 can be a little bit tricky to defend. Um, I, I disagree that this is a dangerous position for black, but it is something that um, is an option. And then, of course, there's bishop h4, just retreating the bishop and keeping the pressure on the diagonal. Justin opted for bishop h4, which is by far the most popular move. And then here, I, I actually have a decision because... Essentially, I could go for what I did in the game, which was to play something along the lines of knight bd7 and b6. But I can also entertain the Lasker variation with knight e4. And knight e4 actually has a very, very rich history. And in fact, the game I recall uh, that's probably one of the most famous games in the system with knight e4 is actually a game that was played 
in the last game of the World Championship match between Vesel and Topolov and Vichy Anand. Um, there's a little bit of history there where uh, essentially the mas- match was tied going into the last game, and so everyone was thinking it was going to be tie breaks, but Topolov pressed a little bit too much in the white side of this position, and Black actually wound up winning the game and the match, and it was like a very, very shocking uh, finish. Um, But anyways, pretty much in the setup after 94, Black tries to trade a few pairs of minor pieces, um, essentially uh, essentially arguing that by trading a few pairs of minor pieces, he alleviates his space disadvantage a little bit. And then once he plays b6 or knight d7 and c6, he's going to have you know very, very solid positions. So the Lasker is an option, but I opted not to go forward in this one. Anyways, instead I did go b6, and uh, the idea is just to put the bishop on b7, knight on d7, and then play c5. After b6, Justin played rook c1. Uh, interesting move kind of teeing up pressure on the c-file maybe you know making me think twice about playing c5 because i might have a hanging hanging pawns type of structure which can be a little bit precarious but was not something i was super concerned about and after rook c1 i went bishop b7 just continuing to develop and then the move bishop takes f6 was played and this move is you know quite controversial um again it is an option in the position to, you know, give up the bishop pair to put more pressure on d5. But the question is, is it really worth it to give up the bishop pair to do this? And I think uh, I go back and forth with that question. Ultimately, I think it isn't worth it. But I will, sh- you know, you're going to see over the course of the game whether white has pressure or not on my my pawn structure because that's pretty much why you do this. Because after bishop takes f6, I recapture with on f6, and then. C takes D5 is played. Note that if White just develops now, plays a move like Bishop E2, now I'm going to take on C4, and after Bishop C4, I can eventually break with C5, and I have no problems to speak of. I have the two bishops in an open position, I'm pretty much nearly symmetrical pawn structure after I play the C5 break, and you know White's just worse if there's no dynamic in the position in his favor. So the point is that after c takes d5 and e takes d5, white's argument is that my pawns, particularly the d and c pawns, are a little bit sensitive and difficult to mobilize, and I have to really determine what my pawn structure is going to look like, because ultimately I can decide to play it with c6, just reinforcing my d5 pawn, and you know it's it's kind of solid, but maybe a little bit passive, and cuts off my bishop on this diagonal, maybe allowing white to play e4 at a later juncture. Or I could play it with c5, um, and after that, white could consider taking on c5 and giving me hanging pawns, or just keeping the tension and ultimately putting pressure on d on the d5 pawn because it can never be defended by a pawn again if my pawn on c5 is adjacent to the d5 pawn. So that dynamic is at play where black is basically going to have to make a decision about his queenside pawn structure, and white is arguing that the headache that black is going to have to contend with is not actually worth the bishop pair. So Anyways, after e takes d5, uh, white played bishop g3. That's the best square, best diagonal for the bishop. Typically, when you're developing bishops, usually the longest diagonal is usually the best diagonal to put it on. Um, Not a hard and fast rule, but something to think about. And the nice thing about bishop d3 is in some circumstances, if I put a rook on c8, sometimes bishop f5 is an extremely annoying move um, targeting and controlling the c8 square. So... After bishop d3, I decide now to play c5, and this was essentially my decision, was that I thought c6 was a little bit too passive. I thought playing with the duo in the center made a little bit more sense, and I thought the hanging pawns wouldn't be such a huge deal if d takes c5 is played, because I do have bishops, and in the open position, I thought that would kind of compensate for me. So, after c5... White castled, but just to illustrate, if d takes e5, b takes e5, I think I can play knight d7, I can put the rook on c8, in some positions I might consider playing c4, and I would argue actually that the b2 pawn is just as much as a target as the c pawn uh, might be, and uh, 
I don't see how White can manufacture a third attacker on the D5 pawn very quickly because essentially you have the knight on C3 and eventually the queen on D1, but to get a third attacker on that D5 pawn, I don't really see it. So I think Black would be fine here. And so Justin obviously agreed because he castled and essentially is trying to keep the tension on the structure. I now played the move knight d7, and this is always the move that you're going to play with the knight in this structure because you want the bishop to keep an eye on the center. So to put the knight on c6 would interrupt the bishop's connection with the center and would be a mistake. And the other reason you play knight d7 actually is because you entertain actually you know recapturing on c5 with the knight which might seem extremely counterintuitive because then what the black pawn on d5 would truly be isolated but it's not the end of the story and we'll, we'll get uh, into that a little bit later so anyways after knight d7 white now when bishop b1 and this is actually a very very interesting move because it actually entertains two ideas um, one idea it entertains is just a battery on this diagonal with the queen and bishop trying to give mate on h7 the other idea it entertains, which is actually kind of sneaky, is actually transferring the bishop to a2 to put pressure on d5. So there are circumstances where essentially white goes a3 and then bishop a2, and it's just an extremely, extremely unique idea. And I first saw this bishop b1 idea in a setup very similar to this at a game I played at um, in February, actually, I went over it on in this channel. It was against Kasper Jostowski. I, I'm probably bludgeoning that pronunciation, but he's a young Polish player that you know really put me to the test in this in a in a Carlsbad structure with his bishop b1, bishop a2 idea, and it shocked me at the time. So there's a, definitely a Road Grandmaster video with this idea before from February. Uh, fe my games in February. I think it was the the Southwest class, if you're looking for the, the actual tournament name. But anyways, uh, after Bishop B1, that's an idea. So multi-purpose move there. And last but not least, it also uncovers the queen actually put pressure on D5. So there are three themes there, which I'm going to illustrate with the arrows right now. So anyways, after Bishop B1, I played the move a6, and I thought for some time here because essentially d takes c5 you may consider to be a threat right now. So the question is, how should I deal with that? And basically, my candidates were to you know actually play c4, relieve the tension, or play a move that allows d takes c5, after which I'd have to recapture with the knight. And I thought that playing c4 would actually probably be a mistake because I didn't see how I could very quickly get in b5, b4 to disrupt this knight on c3. And I thought white might be able to break in the center with this e4 move or actually maybe even put more pressure on the d5 pawn at some point with a move like a3, bishop a2, and maybe even b3. Now, right now that looks a little bit far-fetched, but I did just kind of feel intuitively that releasing the tension would actually kind of be unwise because now my bishop lacks scope, my dark square bishop, the one that has no opponent, lacks scope on this diagonal for the near foreseeable future. So I thought that a6 was a clever move because it actually still entertains c4 because now I'm actually preparing b5 um, you know, in certain positions and then the pawn is actually going to roll. So if white plays a lackadaisical move, I could play c4 now because I'm also ready to play b5. The other idea is that in some lines it's nice to just cover the b5 square from uh, white's minor pieces, particularly the knight on b5. In a lot of positions, the knight does consider going there and sometimes even queen a4 connecting the rooks and getting some pressure on this diagonal and by playing a6 I'm able to just stomp that out with b5 so after a6 white played the move d takes c5 and he actually takes up the challenge and decides to give me the isolated pawn and you know here I have to take with the knight because the d5 pawn is hanging so after knight takes c5 uh, and now knight d4. We have the first kind of critical study-like position of the game where essentially both sides have their trumps. Um, black has the two bishops and white has the better pawn structure because of my isolani on d5. And the question, you know, as is the case in a lot of chess positions, is who is better and why? Now, it is of my opinion that this position is already 
a tiny bit better for black. And the reason I feel that way is because I don't believe it's very easy to manufacture pressure on the D5 pawn for white. Again, getting a third attacker is extremely challenging, especially now that the knight is blocking the queen on D5. And also, I don't think the isolated pawn on D5 is such a problem because my bishop on F6 is really doing a great job of observing the square in front of the isolated pawn. And a lot of times, the most important square in isolated pawn positions is the pawn, or is the, excuse me, the square in front of the IQP. And because I have that firmly under my control, I always have some options at certain positions to take on D4 and unisolate my pawn if the queen leaves the, the D file. Because then E takes D4 would have to be played. And then all of a sudden my D pawn is not as weak or isolated as before. So I think that dynamic of always having this bishop you know, as an option to take or to even just put more pressure on the diagonal is just something that is nice to know. So I felt pretty good here. And so really, I just need to play actively, um, you know, get my rooks into the game, uh, rook e8, rook c8, connect my rooks, and I thought I'd be fine. Uh, lastly, you might say, well, isn't this bishop on b7 terrible because it's just blocked behind the pawn d5? That is true for now, but the bishop has a certain uh, potential that shouldn't be underestimated. And I'll just say that, you know, I, I mentioned this before, there's a book by uh, Silas uh, Esben Lund called The Secret Life of Bad Bishops. And what I learned actually from that book, I highly recommend it, is that the light squared bishop that's usually trapped behind pawns is never quite as bad as it seems. So um, it has the potential to essentially um, maneuver around and become, you know, a serious piece. So anyways, after knight d4, I went rook e8, getting my, one of my rooks to the, the uh, half-open file. And now white played queen c2, trying to get the pressure on h7 with this battery. Um, but I didn't really think queen c2 was that good because after the move g6, which I played, I think the queen's actually kind of vulnerable on the c-file and will ultimately have to move again because I'll be able to put a rook on c8 and then exert pressure. So I don't love queen c2, and I think this g6 move is actually a move I was going to play anyway because I want to block out this light squared bishop, and I also wanted to seize control some of these light squares on the king side given the fact that I just didn't have coverage with my bishop being on the other side of the board. So I wasn't very impressed by queen c2. So anyways, after g6, white now went rook fd1, reasonable developing move. And now I went rook c8, lining my rook up against the queen on c2. And already here I'm threatening knight e4, and I thought, you know, this is actually pretty good for black, because let's say white plays a move like h3. Um, now if knight e4, if the queen moves, I could play knight takes c3, and after rook takes c3, oops, not rook c2, uh, rook takes c3, rook takes c3, and b takes c3, all of a sudden, we have a scenario where both sides actually have three pawn islands because now white's pawns are split on c3 and a2. And I would argue, I think correctly, that the c3 pawn is just as weak, if not weaker, than the d5 pawn. And so you really can't allow knight e4. So instead, after rook c8, white went queen e2 to step out of the way of the potential pin. And now I played the move queen e7, which I thought was a very nice multi-purpose move, essentially getting my queen off of uh, off of the d-file and also lining it up with the queen on e2. Now, in this position, I actually thought for some time, because tactically, there was actually this option to play bishop takes d4. And I mentioned this earlier, again, that one of the nice things is the square in front of the IQP is usually the most important square. And if you control that, normally you have good prospects. And here the point is that I'm giving up this bishop because then I have knight e6. And all of a sudden, after the rook moves again, I actually have d4, which is a very, very serious option that looks very scary, actually, because... All of a sudden, my bishop is opened up on this diagonal. Uh, my knight might launch into play with knight f4, and I'm liberating, it would seem, my IQP. But the reason I didn't go for this is because after d4, I thought, 
White had the move. Bishop e4, not taking on d4, keeping this pin and neutralizing the pressure on this diagonal. And after bishop, after, well, rook takes d3, to be frank, I, I saw but I didn't really believe in. And that's why I kind of stopped this line. Because I was looking at positions with a bishop takes e4, knight takes e4. And I thought that the combination of knight f6 check in conjunction with rook takes d8 and the pin on the d5 would probably not be a good idea for me to go for this type of position. So this is why I rejected it. But the computer points out that there's rook c3, bishop takes b7, rook c1, and knight c5. And frankly, I did not see the extent of this particular line where it does appear that black is getting reasonable control because even though white has the bishop here and I have the knight, um, I'm actually going to create a weakness on the king side. So after bishop f3, d takes f3, f takes e3, this is a position that's better for black um, after a5 because the knight is cemented really nicely on c5, shutting down the, the open c file. And I have a weakness on e3, a fixed weakness to really target. So this is a position that is really, really tough for white to play. And surprisingly, I got a, very, a position very similar to this later down the line in the game, but it was an opportunity I could have gone for here. So anyways, um, I did not go for bishop takes d4 and knight e6 because I didn't see the extent of the rook c3 in conjunction with knight c5 idea. And instead, after queen e2, I played the move queen e7, just like getting off of the d file. And here I actually was entertaining bishop d4, knight e6, because I thought in this particular version, there's no pin on the d pawn anymore. So I thought, you know, now I, these tactics look pretty nice. So after queen e7, white went queen g4, stepping the queen away from the e file where it was pinned, and also in some lines, entertaining pressure on the g6 pawn um, and you know sometimes even entertaining threats like knight f5 um, uh, taking advantage of me being pinned so I have to be a little bit careful uh, a move like king g7 much might seem natural uh, just walks into knight f5 check so I don't want to uh, lose like that so after queen g4 I played the move h5 and I thought this was a really really nice move very very useful move and Notice how with this move g6 earlier and now with h5, how I'm establishing these pawns on the light squares um, and I have complete coverage on the king side now, which is awesome because my bishop is lording over the dark squares and now my pawns are set up on light squares where I have a really, really promising position. And I was already thinking in some respects of some alpha zero games where you actually play h4 and h3 to undermine uh, white's king side. So I actually think the structure is really, really ideal. I have mentioned in the past that this is also the pawn chain or the pawn structure you want if you have a rook end game, um, because if you set the pawns up with h5, g6, h, f7, uh, you, uh, white can't actually create any weaknesses in your position or split pawns, um, uh, even though he might have a majority on the king side. So yeah, a really, really nice move, this h5 move. So after h5, white actually went queen f3, stepping off of the g-file. And you can argue that, you know, maybe white should have gone queen f3 right away because to now, you know, have backed up and given me this h5 move, this was an improvement for my position. And now after queen f3, the d-pawn is attacked. So I played the move bishop takes d4 and here i decided to take my chance now you might say well you could defend with rook c d8 or rook e d8 and yeah you know i think black is still a little bit better um there but one thing i didn't like is if i play like rook e d8 or rook c d8 for instance or rook e d8 i thought white might go knight e2 and now there's a very nice grip on the d4 square and this knight might even transfer to f4 where it might have some prospects so i thought it was kind of now or never to play this bishop takes d4 96 idea and i found a really really nice tactical detail after bishop takes d4 which i think my opponent might have missed now white here played the move rook takes d4 but there was a really really beautiful point after 
E takes D4. And maybe you can pause the video here. Um, again, this variation didn't happen, but maybe you can pause the video here and try to figure out what black was going to play in this mission after E takes D4, because it's a quite a unique idea that I think is quite remarkable. All right, so hopefully you got a chance to pause the video and figure out what the move is. It turns out that in this, this, in this position, and this is actually something I calculated during the game, I have the very beautiful move knight a4. And the point is, is that the pawn on d5 is actually immune, or excuse me, the knight on a4 is also immune. That's actually the more valuable piece. Because after knight takes a4, there's actually a mate on e1, because black actually, you know, be, is able to take advantage of white's back rank problems. So, essentially, the knight on a4 is immune, and the problem here is that I'm also attacking the b2 pawn, and there's no simple way to defend it. In fact, you can't defend it, because if you move a rook, let's say, to d2, then again, you have this back rank problem with uh, queen on e1, and if you play b3, again, you still have a back rank problem on e1. Um, I wouldn't take on c3 again because that would the, the queen would be guarding the square. But basically, it just means that you're winning a pawn on b2. And it's actually a very, very important pawn because once the b2 pawn drops, the knight on c3 is not secure. And uh, I would also be hitting the rook on d1 with tempo. So after knight a4, white really just needs to play h3. And now I can take on b2 and move my queen to g5, and I'm just a clear pawn up with a pretty much close to winning position uh, uh, because my knight's going to come back to c4 and I'm going to consolidate. So very, very unusual tactic with uh, e takes d4 and knight a4, and because of that, it forces white to take with the rook, which allows me to play the move knight e6. And so essentially, I found this move knight e6, um, I just could have played it a little bit earlier than I wound up playing it, but I thought I got a good version of the idea from previous variations in this position because after knight e6, white has to move the rook, and now I play the move d4, and all of a sudden the bishop is lined up against the queen. The queen is no longer pinned along the d file, right? Um, so it seems like all my pieces are coming to life. And another caveat is this bishop on b1 right now is really not a good piece because it's restricted by my kingside pawn. So all of a sudden, I have this coordination and the position is springing to life. After d4, white played the move knight d5, which is pretty much uh, obligatory because the knight on c3 is harassed. And if you play a move like knight e4, uh, you're essentially walking into a pin that you can't kind of cover because of, I think the move f5 check should do the trick. Um, or not not check, but f5, knight f6, king f7. I think I'll eventually wind up winning this piece, even though the knight tends to dance around a little bit. But, um, and at the very least, actually, if knight d5, I could just take on d5, take on c1, and then again get the structure against this weak e pawn. So, anyways, after d4, knight d5, I actually did take. And after queen takes d5, rook takes c1, rook takes c1, and d takes c3, this actually wound up happening. So I didn't actually just repeat myself. Uh, the point is now after f takes c3, I get this beautiful structure, and it's really, really difficult for white to defend, especially with the bishop still being stuck on b1, kind of a passive observer. You know, there it didn't it wound up that there wasn't any serious attack on my king, and so it's actually kind of just misplaced on that diagonal. So after bishop, after f takes e3, I'm now thinking, all right, it's time to win the game. I have a really promising position, um, a really nice structure. How do I take advantage of my coordination and White's lack of coordination? I decide to play the move knight f4. And it's a nice little tactical idea that wins a pawn, but it's actually not the best move in the position. Um, instead, the best move would have been knight c5. And I think this is actually quite instructive because with the knight on c5, I block the rook on the c file. And the point is, is that I'm still attacking the e3 pawn, and it's pretty much not a pawn you're going to even 
really try to defend. Because if you play a move like e4, you're really asking for it because now the bishop is locked out uh, on the diagonal. And now I don't even want to take the pawn. I actually just want to play on the dark squares. And so after e4, I wouldn't play knight takes e4. I'd probably play rook d8. And the point is now, once the queen moves, let's say, to c4, uh, this position is almost over after a move like rook d2, because now I'm threatening queen g5 and queen g2 mate. I'm threatening the b2 pawn. And you could see, just by playing this move e4, all of a sudden, these dark squares on the in the king side and on in the center are kind of like Swiss cheese. So rook d2, knight c5, rook d2 would be a star move. And so after knight c5, the computer's saying queen f3. And here, again, I don't even try to win the pawn right away, but instead I play the move a5 and cementing my knight on c5 so it can't be harassed by b4. And this would just keep the pressure on even though the material is equal because I'm essentially playing against this bishop on b1, which really lacks squares. In fact, it only has one square right now it can go to on c2. So kind of instructive where, you know, cashing in right away actually... Um, spoil some of the chances in the position, and uh, that's why my move knight f4 was not great. After knight f4, we kind of get to a, a forced end game because after queen f3, I'm pretty much obliged to trade on e3 now, and so I played queen takes e3, takes and rook takes, and king f2, and then I played rook e5, and all of a sudden here we have an end game on the board where. I'm a pawn up, uh, and I, you know, I have a, a pretty active knight right now. But White's bishop is a good piece, uh, and you know, like I said, bad bishops can become, uh, even the worst bishops can usually become good pieces at some point if the game goes long enough. And so the dynamic at play right now is really I'm a pawn up, but White ultimately has a, you know, the better minor piece, and I really need to try and squeeze this position, but it's not a winning position. And I think that's important to note is that it's extremely unpleasant to defend a position like this. Not easy at all, but not winning. And I'm not going to go over every single move in this particular ending because it was quite a long one. But I'll say this. Justin defended extremely, extremely well, and it was really, really tough to manufacture pressure. And one of the reasons that's the case is because even though the knight on f4 looks active now, it's not actually particularly stable because it doesn't, it's not reinforced by a pawn. So that's another reason why this knight on c5 was such a strong piece because on c5, it eyed central squares like e4 and d3, but it also would have been cemented by the b6 pawn, especially if it was played in conjunction with a5 and wouldn't have been able to be pushed away. And so the knight on f4 now is considerably worse than it would have been on c5, and that makes this another reason why it's difficult to convert. So after rook e5, white played g3. I now went knight e6 trying to get back to c5. Um, but now rook d1 is played, and this is actually quite clever because not only is he stopping knight d4 ideas, he's also trying to get counterplay with rook d6. I now went a5, trying to actually establish the setup with the pawn on a5 and the knight on c5, but this gives white valuable time with h4. And h4 is actually a good move trying to fix my pawn structure so it's difficult to mobilize my majority. It's somewhat double-edged though because now g3 is weaker than it was a move ago. After h4, I did go knight c5 and I finally have this dream set up. But the difference here is that this rook is way more active than it should have been because the rook should have been on c1 and then I could have gone rook d5 and taken the d file myself. White now in bishop c2, uh, controlling uh, some light squares on the queen side. It would have been a little bit better to go rook d6, but uh, just challenging the pawn right away because now I have to go b5. And again, now the knight is not as secure if these pawns are pushed up the board. Um, so now the pawns actually kind of become targets a little bit. But bishop c2 was played. I now went rook e6 to stop this rook d6 idea. 
and then rook d4 was played. And you can see right now that white is kind of getting reasonable coverage for his bishop because essentially right now it, the bishop controls all my knight's squares forward in the position. Every single square can go to is covered by the bishop on c2. So that's, again, kind of illustrative of why the bishop is usually a pretty good minor piece. So after rook d4, I went... King f8, trying to get my king in, really to control the entry squares that the rook could invade in on the d file. Um, that was really the idea. And now b4 was played. Excellent, excellent move. Now, it might seem counterintuitive to trade uh, pawns when you're actually down material, but essentially what Justin knows, um, and again, strong, strong players, you know, realize some of these things they they kind of understand which exchanges are good and which aren't and basically what he knew is that if we actually simplify to a rook end game that's just a three versus two um with the pawns on the king side um that's actually a drawn position so essentially he's trying to liquidate all the pawns on the queen side because the presence of the pawns on the queen side gives me targets to work with and he's trying to trade these pawns and then essentially draw the position uh, in a rook endgame. And I'm trying not to exchange. I'm trying to improve my position without exchanging. But you can see Justin's forcing the issue here, which is smart. So after he takes before, rook takes before, I only have one pawn left on the queen side. And I want to try to hold it together, but it's tough to avoid uh, further exchanges because of what Justin uh, now plays. Because I went king e7. And now he goes a4. And now the idea is honestly to play rook b5 and a5. And sometimes to just play a5 right away and get that last pawn off the board. And there isn't really much I could do about it. Um, I could entertain knight, BD, knight b7 and knight a5. But the point is, is like if I wind up going for knight b7 and let's say rook, let's say rook b5, knight a5. I can't even entertain winning this position with a knight that passive on the rim. So even though I managed to you know, keep the A and B pawns on the board, unless somehow I'm able to force the rooks off the board, this is not a position that I can begin to win. So very, very smart move by him, this a, B4 and then now A4. I played the move rook D6 trying to get counterplay in the, on, in the center and on the king side because I thought the pawns were going to be liquidated. And after king E3... I played f5, and f5 might seem a little bit counterintuitive because I'm, you know, basically giving myself a backward pawn on g6, and also, you know, basically my pawns um, are all in light squares where it might seem to be a target for the bishop on c2, but my point is that by establishing my pawns on the light squares like this, I'm actually restricting the scope of the bishop on two important diagonals. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm actually preventing white from actually exchanging uh, any of his pawns on the king side because now g4 is out of the question. So essentially, my thought process was now the g3 pawn is fixed as a target that I can harass. So after f5, white actually did play a5, which is a really, really good move. And after b takes a5, rook b5, the last pawn is coming off the board because my knight on c5 and the pawn on a5 are attacked. I move my knight. And now after rook takes a5, we have a position that, you know, uh, from a uh, theoretical pr uh, perspective, is a draw. Um, White has done really well to actually establish this structure on the king side and liquidating all the pawns on the queen side. And if the bishop and knight are exchanged, I can't make progress in this position because essentially all the rook end games are a draw. Like like H and F versus H is a draw. Like if I change if I exchange the G pawn for the H pawn, that's a draw. If I exchange the F pawn for the G pawn and just have H and G versus H, that's also a draw. And so Really, my only chance is to try and keep the pieces on the board and drum up counterplay against g3. And that's essentially what I try to do over the course of the next 30 moves or so. So we're going to zip through it um, because the evaluation didn't fundamentally change. You're just going to see a lot of maneuvering to put the pressure on. So uh, check this out. So king f6, bishop d3, rook e6, king f2. 
knight e5, again, attacking this bishop, angling for the g4 square, bishop e2, covering it, king g7, note, by the way, that knight g4 check is just a draw, um, I can't improve here with the rook just sits on a2 and he just waits for me to to essentially uh, break with f4 and then he starts to harass me with checks and the thing is if i try to bring my king closer um to try and like exchange the rook somehow then i'll go rook a8 and check me from behind so that's why these types of positions are just drawn so i didn't do that i went king g7 shuffled some more maneuvered some more Tried to get my knight to a good outpost, teased him with checks, went back. Note that my king on h6 is actually kind of trapped here, but I thought I was at least avoiding checks, so that's why I did it. Um, now we get to a new configuration. My king is still locked out. Again, a lot of moves happening here. And now, finally, something kind of happened. So I'm just going to back up just a second. So rook c2, king e1, and here, essentially, I tried to essentially drum up counterplay with the king being passive but justin at the very very best moment gets active on me because after bishop d5 he's actually hitting the b 3 but also threatening bishop g8 and rook h7 mate and i'd seen this but i thought it, this was kind of my best chance to kind of create some type of confusion in the position and frankly i'd been maneuvering for the past 30 plus moves in part because it meant that he was losing uh, losing time. So by the time we got here, he was pretty much at like, I had like 15 to 20 minutes, and he had like just a few minutes left on his clock. So I basically, that's the other uh, advantage of kind of being patient um, in a position where you're better, is you're just pressing, 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 and then you wait for a critical moment, or you make the position critical when they have less time. So that's what I did here. So after king e1, and I went knight d4, and now bishop g8, and now this mate threat is on the board. So I have to address that, and the only way to do that is to play g5 and liberate my pawns. And this was essentially my idea, as I thought that, you know, while white is trying to, you know, get this checkmate going, this initiative going on my king, his bishop is actually sufficiently drawn away from the king on e1, where I thought I might have some pressure in the interim, because now the bishop will be misplaced if there's no mate. So after g5, uh, h takes g5, and king takes g5, my dream scenario was something like king g4 and king takes g3, um, or knight f3 check, and sometimes... Uh, rook f2 mate if I got that far. After king takes g5, white played bishop d5, and this is a really, really good move, and pretty much should have spelled an end to my initiative, because essentially, all of a sudden, the bishop is coming back and covering a very important square so that my knight can't just jump in. Again, exchanging pawns is kind of not really what I want to do, because if I play a move like h4, um, black can ultimately try to bring the king back in and press, but eventually white will just sack the bishop for the f pawn. And rook and knight versus uh, rook is actually a very, very simple hold. It's not a difficult one to defend. Although there have been some instances of people losing it, it's really not difficult. And in fact, if you've seen my game in the Road to Grandmaster series against Yaroslav Zerobuk, um, I actually defended that one and I think invented what I called the the four corners method where you just keep your rook in the four corners and far away from your king to avoid any checks and then eventually uh, any, any knight forks basically and then you eventually just defend and you get to the 50 move rule. So anyways, I did not go for h4. I went instead for king f6 trying to just challenge this rook and you know, get it off of the E files that I might have some rookie two check or 92 ideas. After king of six, white played rookie eight. Uh, I think that's smart, keeping the rook on the E file. And now I played rook C5, trying to challenge the bishop. And now bishop G2 was played. And all of a sudden, white has done a fantastic job to coordinate and kind of figure this out. Um, I don't really have much anymore in this position, and it's hard to get... Uh, much more pressure on the position, but I did continue to keep trying, especially given the fact that my opponent now was basically playing with just a few minutes. I went king f7, attacking the rook, and after rook h8, 
I went rook c1 check. And then after king f2, rook c2 check. And this is essentially my idea was now the king is actually kind of um, in a tough spot because the, it's actually guarding the bishop on g2. And what I thought was is that if you play a move like king g1, um, there might be some problems connected to to knight e2 check. That was basically what I thought. I thought knight e2 check, you know, the g3 pawn is loose, so you might go king f2 or king h2. And all of a sudden, I thought here there might be some danger with king g6, with uh, white being a little bit too passive here, although I don't truly believe it. Or maybe there's a move like f4. This is another thing I was looking at. Like g takes f4, knight takes f4, and I'm holding on to my h5 pawn for now and still threatening the g2 bishop. Although even this position is drawn because in this one, now white can play king g3, and again, we can hit, get the famed rook nice versus rook position, but it's just a draw. So, anyways, after rook c2, white actually played king e3, which is a really, really good move and actually should simplify the position because ultimately, if I take on g2 now, after king takes d4, this is actually a dead draw. And the reason for it is because after rook takes e th g3, you, don't, you can probably play rook takes h5 and hold, but the... But it actually is kind of risky because if you play rook takes h5, I go king f6, and this king is actually cut off on the on the third rank. So this actually might be losing for white. But the th move that is draws right away and is much stronger than rook takes h5 is king e5. And this is actually what I saw is that now you actually just go for the f5 pawn instead of the h pawn because these positions with the h pawn are just impossible to win. And I can't actually defend this pawn effectively because king g6 runs into rook g8 check. And now it's a white that wins picking off my rook. So essentially, I didn't want that simplification. And so I went knight e2 here trying to keep the game going. After knight e2, I'm attacking the g3 pawn. White went bishop f3, which is a reasonable move. But again, four simplifications would have been a little bit smarter. And rook takes h5 is way more sensible to me. Because now you get one another pawn off the board. And after rook h3, we again get this type of end game where it's just not possible for me to win. So instead, though, bishop f3 is played. And I played knight takes g3. And this position is actually kind of tricky because you can't... You, I mean, you don't want to take bishop takes h5 now because there's actually king g7. And all of a sudden, the rook on h8 is actually under fire, and uh, it's actually guarding the bishop on h5, so it seems like not as easy to hold anymore. Although in this position, bishop, h, bishop d1 probably does do the trick. So it just goes to show that even in these positions where it seems kind of dire, um, you know, white's still holding. So anyways, because of that, now Justin actually went king f4 in his time trouble and this is actually a good move challenging my knight on g3 but i played the move king g7 and at least for the moment i'm actually two pawns up because now the rook on h8 has to move and after rook uh a8 i got to play h4 and so all of a sudden it's not totally trivial like this is a, a this is a dead draw honestly but it's not completely dead um, and again, part of the reason it's a dead draw is because the pawns are split, and it's very, very difficult to mobilize the pawns with white being so active with a bishop on f3 and a king on f4. So it is a draw, but requires precision now. After h4, white did actually pr play pretty precisely with rook a7 check, and essentially he, did, he realized that if he just checks me incessantly, my king can't stay on the king side near the pawns. So I ran over to the queen side trying to stop this. But as soon as I did that, and my king was totally cut off, he darted back toward the king side. And honestly, I thought we were going to shake hands in a few moves here. But I decided to continue to keep trying because, well, I mean, it's the last round and I, I really want to win. And so after rook h7... Rook takes h4 is a threat, so I went rook c4 check. And after king g5, I went 
knight e4. And this was kind of my last salvo chance because basically what my idea was is that if king takes h4, I have this cheapo knight f6 discovery check. And I thought that if king takes f5, well, obviously it's a draw. <laughs> but maybe I could try to push the envelope with something like knight f2 and try to go h3 and at least get my pawn to h3 because if you go like king g5, h3... The game is still continuing, although it's a complete draw because the bishop can sacrifice for the pawn. Instead, though, after knight e4 check, Justin played kind of a strange move in my position, in my opinion. He played the move bishop takes e4. And this move draws the game, but it's actually kind of tricky because now after f takes e4, I have two pawns that are kind of dangerous, and all of a sudden my king on b4 is not completely far away from a pawn that's relevant. So I did not think this exchange was pretty smart, but again, he's actually on less than 30 seconds here, and it's tough to be super critical when you're in you know serious time trouble. But I did not love this move. After f takes e4, white now played the move King f4, and this move to me is one of the most puzzling moves because really and truly, if you want to, you know, end this game and you understand that, you know, you're not playing for a win, you want to draw the game, you play the move rook takes h4 and you don't really think twice about it because essentially I can't push um, e3 right now. And uh, yeah, because I can't push e3, um, I'll probably go king b4. And you don't play king f4 because that runs into some, you know, discovered checks. But you just move your rook somewhere. You can play a move like rook... Uh, you play a move like rook h1, for instance. And the point is now, after... Uh, if I play king c3, there's king f4, and you're, you, get there, you get back there in time, I believe. And if you go... And if I go e3 you go rook e1, and the important thing is my king is not yet on c3 to protect the e3 pawn, and so if I defend it horizontally, there's king f4, and then again, white catches the pawn, and if I defend it vertically with, or excuse me, if I defend it with rook e4, there is, uh, uh, there's king f5, and again, this rook is now forced back, and after king f4, again, white's in time to collect the e pawn so just taking the pawn h4 right away would i think have been the simpler way to go and king f4 allows me another trick and the point here is that after king f4 i played the move king b4 and all of a sudden this is actually kind of tricky because you can't play rook takes h4 because of e3 check and now the rook would be picked off, and if you go king g3, I can actually trade rooks and promote my last pawn. And so you can't actually take the h4 pawn, and you have to be extremely, extremely careful. After king b4, white played the move king e3, which is correct, uh, which is a good move. And now I played the move h3. And all of a sudden, it's kind of tricky again because now you can't take on h3 because of rook c3 check. And you have to make a decision under duress, which is not very easy. Now, the thing you kind of have to recognize is that the king is actually well-placed to defend the e-pawn, and you really just need to corral the h-pawn. And if you corral the h-pawn, you really have no problems because these pawn-up positions um, where... Uh, where essentially, um, where essentially the king is in uh, the, the defending side is in good defensive position, uh, means you can establish a philidor type of position where you wait till the pawn gets to the third rank, and then you start to check from behind. And so you guys can Google that philidor position. Very one of the more instructive rook end games. But the point is, because white is so well positioned, it's just the h pawn he has to worry about. But he can't take it right now, so he has to be careful in how to do it. And so why don't you pause the video here and try to figure out? There's more than one way white to play and draw because this is a very very critical moment, and it's one that you know is important to know. So why don't you pause the video and try to figure it out? 
All right, hopefully you got a chance to work out some of the details in this Rook ending. I did say there are multiple ways to, you know, play it. One of the better ways to play it is just to go, uh, just to go King F, t uh, sorry, King F4. And the idea here, kind of counterintuitively, is now that the H pawn is on H3 and not on H4, White can actually threaten to take it because there's no discovery checks anymore. And so the point is that you're actually threatening to take the pawn while still keeping observation over the E3 square. And so, I mean, let's just say I go H2 now. Well, then just Rook takes H2. And if I go king c3 well then there's rook takes h3 and if i try to go king d2 trying to mobilize my pawn now there's rook e3 and white recovers the e4 pawn so essentially king f4 threatening to win the h pawn is an effective one another move that holds is king d2 same idea to take on h3 um and this also just holds. Uh, it just it just works. Note that if I go like rook d4 check, king e3 back, and uh, if I give a check here, you just secure the e pawn, and then walk the king over to the h file. So yeah, so king f uh, so king d2 is a is effective move. Uh, king f4 is effective. King f2 also works, although it's a little bit trickier, I think, because after rook c3, rook h4 needs to be played to secure the e pawn. And then this type of position is also drawn. Um, so you can see there, king f2, king d2, and king f4, all moves that keep observation of the e pawn and kind of eye the dark squares hold. Unfortunately for Justin, he made a losing move here. And again, it's just tough to, to work it all out with 30 seconds left. But he played the move king e2. And this move... Uh, amazingly loses under very study-like circumstances. So this is a very study-like rook ending, in my opinion. And the move that wins here is the move rook c3. And all of a sudden, white has a huge, huge problem, and it's that white can't actually win either pawn. Uh, and if white can't win either pawn and my king just walks to d4, the position is actually losing for white. But the bigger problem with rook c3 is actually I have the threat of playing h2. And the problem is that rook takes h2 is not possible because of rook c2 and I pick up the rook. And this is kind of a tactical trick that happens sometimes um, in rook end games when the when the king and rook of the defending side are far away from each other is that you can actually get some type of tactics like this based upon um, promoting. So all of a sudden h2 is a serious threat and it's basically impossible to parry. Um, again, if you play a move like king f2, now, um, now I can play king c4 and actually get my king into d4 and actually hold that way, and I believe the position is won, although maybe even here h2 is actually super effective, because again, here, rook takes h2, rook c2 check, leads to a winning king-pawn ending. So, yeah, just a remarkable, remarkable move with rook c3, and the game ended after the move rook h4, uh, because after rook h4, I played the move h2 anyway and again i have this rook c2 check threat and it's just impossible to hold um remarkably and the, another huge point that's important to note is if you put the king back on f1 now saying oh uh, no big deal now uh i can try to take the pawn this is always the trick is i queen and then go rook c rook c1 check and again trade the rooks and use my remaining pawn to queen because I establish opposition um, before white can actually control um, my queening square. So essentially, that's the real trick: is that I'm it's it's defending h2, but also threatening h1 queen. And if you go king d1, thinking, oh, now I, there's no check on c2 or c1. What's the problem? Well, now I actually again have the very study-like move rook a3. And the point is that you still can't take here because of this rook h2, rook h1 threat. 
and uh, yeah, it's just it's just a problem. If you go rook takes e4, now I can just go king c5, and you run out of checks kind of quickly. And then if you bring the rook back again, queen and rook h8 or rook a8. So yeah, it's just crazy. But after rook h4, h2. Justin was kind of shaking his head vigorously because he realized what had happened. And after rook takes e4, check. Even this check doesn't save white because now I went king b3. And uh, yeah, the problem now is that after rook h4, um, I played rook c1. And this is a just a winner because I'm threatening to queen. And if you play... Rook takes h2, again, there's rook c2 check. So after the move rook c1, um, Justin resigned. And uh, yeah, very, very fortunate win for me. Very, very devastating loss for Justin just because he was defending so well for such a long time. Um, but uh, sometimes, you know, the clock just really is not your friend, and if you're under pressure for such a long time, it's difficult to uh, to keep everything in front of you, and unfortunately, he just fell victim to the last trick. Now, I was happy. I mean, this was uh, a huge win for me. Uh, I, f I ended the tournament with four and a half out of five, and what it meant was is I actually tied for first place in the Eastern Open, with Grandmaster Alexander Sh uh, Shabalov. So um, I took home a nice payday, and uh, I left the Princeton area, the New Jersey area, back home, you know, you know, feeling good about wh where my, my chest was over the course of the weekend because I got into a lot of tough positions, but I didn't lose any of them, and I was really tenacious. And, yeah, it was uh, a really, really nice, uh, nice turn of events, so I felt pretty good. So, yeah, uh, that's it for this one. I know it was a marathon game, so thanks for watching, for following along. Please like and or subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support the Road to Grandmaster journey, you can do so by making a donation through the PayPal link in the description below. Thanks again. Take care.